This story happened to me when I was studying in an intermediate vocational school. That year my school had a rule that it was forbidden to go out at night. I was a naughty student so I snuck out to play games at night by climbing the wall. My purpose was to go to an internet shop to play games. These internet shops were a dozen minutes a walk away from my school, but I could do exercise every night by walking to that shop. The internet shop was usually very crowded at night. My friends and I often ran there to play. Although I loved to game, I didn't play all night. I would only play for about two to three hours. That time, as usual, I would play until nearly midnight. After playing for a few hours, I would usually find a noodle shop to eat late and then went back to school. Before going there, I would quickly pay for the game and leave. In a position a few seats away from me, a boy was playing a game while dozing off in a chair. The sleepy boy had a bad temper. No one dared to tease or destroy him at times like this. He dozed off, arms stretched behind his back. When I was passing by, I accidentally touched his arm. I immediately apologized and luckily he didn't wake up. This internet shop was located in a commercial area. The front gate was completely closed, so if I wanted to leave, I had to go through the exit behind. I was walking down the stairs very quietly at the time. Suddenly I saw a man standing right next to the wall opposite the stairs going down. What scared me was that this man had no legs and his body seemed to be floating in the air. I was frightened but also had to leave. When I got too close, he was gone. I quickly assured myself, thinking that I might be a bit dizzy from gaming, so I looked at it wrong. I quickly exited the basement. When I was about to step out of the basement, I came across something strange. A woman was lying on the roof of the hatch with long jet black hair hanging down. She was staring at me. but. The woman had no eyes, even though I knew she was looking right at me. If I hadn't leaned against a wall, I would have fallen to the ground long ago. My legs could no longer stand. Fortunately, the woman also disappeared. My first thought was that this basement was haunted. I immediately decided to run out of there. I was just running out the door when a strong light hit me in my face, so bright that I couldn't see anything. Right after the sound of brakes almost burning the car wheel, I realized I was standing in the middle of the road. If the driver hadn't braked in time, I would have died from being hit by a car. Luckily, I was fine and only received a few scoldings. I almost lost my life, standing on the side of the road for a long time because I was so shocked by what I had just witnessed and faced. My only thought at the time was to hurry back to school, not being able to stay outside anymore. I wandered about walking on the sidewalk, thinking about what I had seen in my mind. I was scared and worried. As I was walking like that, I suddenly heard a weak woman singing from behind. It sounded so far away, yet so close. My back seemed to stiffen. I only dared to look to the side to feel. Unexpectedly behind me, a woman in a white dress was slowly approaching me. I didn't hear any footsteps, only singing. The song was not loud, but the humming was quiet. But when I heard it, I would shiver. I absolutely did not dare to run for fear of her finding out. I could only increase my walking speed, so I strode very long and fast. Although I was quickening my pace, she was able to keep up, even though the distance between us was narrowing. The silence that reached my ears made my heart sink. I was so scared that I couldn't help but cry. I felt like life was too short at the time. My legs also stopped working and I couldn't seem to run away. At the time, I just thought that I didn't study well and would not find a decent job in the future, so I wondered why didn't I just die. At that time, I only thought about death. The thought was so powerful that I fell into silence. Suddenly, a car horn sounded, startling me, and I immediately woke up. The taxi parked on the curb, the driver got out of the car, and suddenly asked me loudly why I wanted to die. It was only at that moment that I realized I was standing in the middle of the street again, but just a few minutes ago I thought I was walking on the sidewalk. The driver looked at me and thought I was about to commit suicide, so he approached me. 
I was scared and started crying out loud. He no longer cursed at me but gently asked me what was wrong and why I was seeking death. He comforted me and then took me back to the school without taking charge. The fact that I was punished for running away from school was inevitable and after that night I fell ill. I had a constant fever and had to take medicine for the rest of the several days at school. At noon the other day a classmate came to the dormitory to visit me and tell me about what had happened in the internet shop we frequented. He said the internet shop I went to the night before had a person who suddenly passed away. He told me the news. I was extremely shocked because the dead person was the one I accidentally bumped into when I was leaving. To this day, I still think that the fact I saw ghosts again and again may be because I accidentally touched that person. Because of him, I could see ghosts. My uncle has worked as a taxi driver for more than five years. This is also the first time that he had encountered something scary as well as strange. He would usually work until after 11 o'clock and at that time around 9 p.m. he would still be doing his job. But on the road he passed, there would be a few customers waiting for him. He would quickly pick up a male guest and invite them to the car. At this time, my uncle would also be taking customers to a place called MP Tower located in the inner city. When he entered the city centre, the road would be very crowded. He would also quickly drop off the customers in front of the big building. He would then drive to another crowded place nearby. On the side of the road, there were three people standing with their hands up to catch a cab. After getting into the car, they told my uncle that they wanted to go to a suburb. The place was more than 110 kilometers from where they were standing and it would have taken a lot of time to get there and back. My uncle gave them the cost. The three of them immediately agreed without making any negotiation. My uncle transported them out of the city and quickly onto the highway. Getting off the highway he would drive into a deserted country road following the instructions of the three young men. The further he drove the darker the road became. It would be surrounded by luxuriant trees. In my uncle's mind, he felt a bit scared, wondering if these three people wanted to trick him into going to a deserted place and commit murder or robbery. It wasn't until the car entered the village that they asked him to stop the car. After paying him, they got out. My uncle immediately drove back to the city. After driving quite a distance, in his mind, he also wanted to catch some more customers on the way to the city because it was convenient and he would have more income then, right? Even though he thought it was wishful thinking, at that moment at the side of the road, a woman was waiting and reaching out to catch the car. The woman was pregnant. He didn't know if it was because she was about to give birth or what was happening, but her expression was extremely contorted. He stopped the car and asked her where she wanted to go. The door opened and the woman awkwardly got into the car but didn't say a word. She only groaned because of the pain in her stomach. When my uncle saw this, he ran to help her get into the car. As this was something that he's never experienced before, he was a little bit confused. He asked the lady if she wanted to go home or go to a hospital. She still did not answer a word. Seeing that the situation might be stressful, he decided to take the woman to the hospital because she was already showing signs of labor. Without hesitation, he drove very quickly because of a hospital location far away. He was afraid that he would not be on time. Sometimes he would look in the rearview mirror to observe the woman's every move. In the back seat, the woman was holding her stomach while groaning. The stomach seemed to be moving as well. Suddenly, Something started protruding very sharply out of her belly. It was not like the movement of a fetus, but more like that of a demon wanting to come out. After that, her stomach moved more and more violently. The fetus repeatedly kicked the belly. The woman cried for help in extreme pain. 
But when my uncle stared at the woman because he was worried about her, he had already let go of the steering wheel. When he turned his head to look back, he felt a large beam of light hitting his face. At this moment in front of him was a car from the opposite direction that was rushing towards him at fast speed. Fortunately, he was able to turn the steering wheel in time so he could avoid the car accident. When he stabilized again, he immediately stopped the car and went to find the owner of the other car to talk to. Although the driver on the other side apologized, my uncle was still angry. He told the other driver that he was carrying a pregnant woman if there was an accident, who would be the responsible one. But after looking at the car, the man on the other side said he had never seen the pregnant woman my uncle talked about. There was no one in the car. My uncle wanted to prove his point, so he led the man back to the car to take a closer look. My uncle pointed at the woman sitting in the back of the car and told the man to look there. What my uncle didn't expect was that the woman had just disappeared. Only a large pile of mucus was left on the car seat. The man thought that my uncle had made a mistake and there was nothing serious, so he left. My uncle couldn't figure out what had happened. He checked the mucus in the back seat. It was not like amniotic fluid during childbirth. It was the kind of mucus that he didn't even know what it would be or what it was, only that it smelled very stinky and foul. He thought to himself that the person he had helped might be a ghost, so he was very scared and did not dare to stay there any longer. When he returned to the city center, he immediately took the car for a wash. Even though it was washed many times, the stench still could not go away. My uncle thought that this car was cursed with bad luck, so he decided to sell it and buy a new one. Finally, there was one thing that he would never forget. The person who bought his car got into a car accident only a week after he sold it. He didn't know if it had anything to do with the ghost he met, but that's what made him never dare to cross that road at night ever again. I have an uncle named Ben, who is my father's third brother. The story I'm about to tell you is also related to him, a man who is extremely addicted to gambling. After losing his job, Uncle Ben couldn't find work. Every night he would go to the casino and try to make a living by this so-called profession. My aunt always tried to stop him, but she never could. In those days, she took care of everything alone. She took care of the whole family and two small children. My uncle just gambled. He played ten times and lost nine times. The family's assets were gone. There was a day when Uncle Ben didn't come home for two days. My aunt didn't go to look for him because that wasn't the first time. On the third night, my uncle returned. My aunt guessed that he only came home because he lost all his money again. But this time, his face was proud. He took out more than 50 million from his pocket and gave it to her and said it was all for her. This proved that he won. He finally won. It was the first time my aunt saw this and more importantly, my uncle promised never to lose again. He also proudly told her about how he won this game. Yesterday, he played Mahjong with some people. He would first lose continuously. All his money was lost, everything, and the people in the casino would kick him out and wouldn't let him play anymore. But even though he begged for the casino to let him continue playing, he was still punished and banned. As he was standing in the hallway cursing, someone called his name from behind. The man told my uncle that maybe he should try praying to the God of Fortune. Maybe then he would win. My uncle didn't show any interest in this. He did not believe in any God. He would sometimes consider praying to different gods, but no God ever helped him to win in gambling. 
The man continued to persuade my uncle, saying that ordinary begging would not be effective. This made my uncle a little curious. He needed to know where to pray to get this effect on him. The man offered to drive my uncle to the place where he could pray to that god. So the two of them went straight and deep into the forest. They crossed a large tree path to a small statue. The stone statue placed neatly in the forest was also covered with a red scarf on its head. The man showed my uncle how to pray. He needed to use his hair and nails as well as blood to make prayers work for this god. My uncle found it strange but he still wanted to try it because he had nothing to lose. And after thinking about it, my uncle decided to pull out some of his hair. He took some hair, nails as well as blood and placed it in a bowl in front of the god statue as an offering. After that, he clasped his hands in prayers and he would pray that he could win every bet he made. As soon as the prayer ended, the wind blew across the statue. That caused the veil to fly off. When the strong winds blew away the veil to reveal the statue's damaged and fierce face, my uncle became scared. He thought maybe he should not have prayed to this statue or altar at all. After leaving, he went back to the casino to borrow money from others to try his luck once again. True to the promise of the stranger and the prayer he made, he won every single bet he made. The amount of money earned was too much to handle. Once my uncle bet ten times and won nine times, no longer as unlucky as before. But every time he won, he would start feeling tired and he would start panting like he had just run three kilometers. He coughed for many days. My aunt advised him to stop gambling, but he still did not listen to her. Every time he came home from gambling, he would bring back a lot of money, which surprised her. But in terms of health, he was not as good as the night before. In just two weeks, my uncle lost weight went from 80 kilograms to only 65. Seeing such an unusual transformation made my aunt worry. She cared about him a lot. She knew he was hiding something from her, but she couldn't convince him to tell her because he thought he had to earn a few billion more before he stopped. The next day, even though he was not feeling well, he still decided to continue to go to the casino to play. My uncle kept winning and winning and he collected a lot of money. But in the fifth game, another player won. My uncle then struggled to breathe. He tried to scream but fell over through the table. It seemed he was having a heart attack. Everyone was shocked. Someone called the ambulance to take him to the hospital. However, he sadly passed away even before the ambulance arrived. My aunt received the bad news and she rushed to the hospital. She cried bitterly because she couldn't say goodbye to him for the last time. He was gone. In just one month, my uncle had lost nearly 20 kilograms before his passing and his health seemed to be declining rapidly. My aunt suspected something was off and asked the doctor for an autopsy. When the results came back, she was shocked for the cause of death could not be determined nor could the doctor explain anything in a scientific way. My aunt was shunned by her husband's death. She suspected that his death was related to some evil deity. So she decided to go to the spiritual place in the forest to find out. When she arrived at the forest following the instructions of a few people, she looked everywhere but couldn't find any statues or altars. It's been three long years since my uncle had died, yet his death still remains a mystery that has made my aunt and our family extremely heartbroken and sad.
I heard this story a long time ago. At one company, workers often worked overtime and left very late to earn extra income. Near 9 o'clock in the evening, a young man named Carol had just finished his shift. Carol was offered a carpool by a colleague, but because the two were not on the same road, Carol refused and intended to take a bus to go home. The factory where the guys worked was in the suburbs and the last bus back to the city left at 9.20 p.m. and arrived at the pickup station around 9.30 p.m. The young man thought he was in time to catch the bus, so when he got out of the factory, the other man drove back first. At this time, the young man looked at his watch. Unexpectedly, it was almost half past nine. Carol knew he could be late, so he rushed to the nearest bus stop. The bus stop was a few minutes by motorbike from the factory. He had to run at full speed to get to the station. When he got there, he was almost out of breath, panting. The young man looked at his watch once again, in a worried expression about afraid of not being on time. Unfortunately, the clock struck 9.40pm, meaning the last bus left the station more than 10 minutes ago. The way back to the city also became longer because it was difficult to catch a car here. Carol was disappointed. He had missed the last bus. He thought about having to take a taxi back to the city and worried about money. While Carol was thinking that, a bus arrived. When the bus arrived, Carol was overjoyed, thinking that the bus was late as he was. This might have been the only exception ever. It could also be considered as Carol's luck. The bus creaked to a stop in front of Carol. Because Carol often rode the bus at the hour, he recognized a familiar driver at a glance. What was strange was that there were so many people on the bus. Normally, at this time of day, only about one or two passengers would be there. This was even more crowded than usual. Only one person on the bus had been following Carol's every move since he got onto it. It was a middle-aged man whose expression changed when he saw Carol. Not paying any attention to this, Carol slowly found an empty seat near the back of the bus and sat down. The man was still staring at Carol and thinking about something. To avoid the angry look, Carol purposely turned his head toward the window and looked down. Unexpectedly, the man stood up and went straight to where Carol was sitting. He approached without a word and a hostile look on his face like Carol had done something wrong with him. Moments later, the man suddenly swung his fist and punched Carol's face. Unable to take it anymore, Carol angrily stood up and argued with the man. He wondered why he hit people like that. Carol didn't have time to say anything when the man ferociously grabbed him by the collar and wanted to drag him out of the bus because he was not pleasing to the eye. He didn't understand what was happening. He just wanted to push the man away, but he couldn't. He begged the people on the bus to help him. But none of the people on the bus would speak up, as if they could neither see Carol nor know what was happening on that bus. Then the man pulled Carol to the front of the bus while he was shouting that he needed to get out of the bus urgently. Despite Carol protesting, the man kept asking him to get off the bus. The driver did not say anything and motioned for the bus to stop. At this time, the bus door was also open. Immediately, the man pulled Carol out of the bus without once looking back at him. The bus door quickly slammed shut and the bus continued to move. When the bus drove away, the middle-aged man let go of his hand and watched as the bus was slowly disappearing. Suddenly he sighed, his face drenched with sweat. He suddenly changed his expression and told Carol that he was scared to death just now. Carol froze in place, thinking the man was losing his mind so he acted like that. This man saw a suspicious and confused look from Carol. So he told them that they were riding on a ghost bus. The man also encountered the process of getting on this bus. Once settled into position, he sensed that something was wrong. The first was that the people on the bus were all lifeless, not talking or breathing. He immediately looked around to examine the situation. The bad luck was that he discovered that all the passengers on the bus had no legs. Only then did he realize that they were not human at all. He was afraid to make a sound and didn't know what to do until he saw Carol getting onto the bus. He realized Carol was a real person 
alive. So, you had to think of a way for both of them to get off of the bus. The man made it clear to Carol and told him to hurry home. Carol thought the man didn't look like a madman lying. By that time there were no more buses so he decided to take a taxi to go home. When he got into the taxi, Carol and the driver accidentally heard the news broadcast on FM radio that the police had found a bus which jumped off the bridge and fell into the river at 4 p.m. The news reached his ears, sending chills down his spine. Soon after, information about the bus was made clear. All nine passengers and the driver died. What was even more bizarre was that it was the same bus that Carol was on. This is a scary story which happened in 2019. Something about an experience with a young man named Kalim. This guy was a gangster who worked as a debt collector and security guard at small bars in town. Kalim was on the road that day when he got an unexpected phone call. While lighting a cigarette and talking about work, a loud noise behind him made him turn his head in surprise. A car honking loudly and travelling at high speed was speeding towards him. It seemed that the car was losing its brakes. The driver's face was panicked, however there was nothing the driver could do. Kalim did not have time to react at that time and the car rushed towards him at breakneck speed. The impact was so strong that Kalim was thrown to the side. The car's tires were all broken at that time and Kalim only saw the sky and earth darkened before him. The car which hit Kalim also stopped on the side of the road. Kalim was unconscious because the impact was so strong it also tore his clothes. There was something very scary on Kalim's biceps. A fearful tattoo suddenly changed his face to become more aggressive. What was happening to Kalim? People around him quickly ran over and called for an ambulance. It was fortunate that he was not in mortal danger. Let's go back in time a bit, a day ago. In order to look cooler and individual or goofy, Kalim went to a tattoo parlor at the end of town to get himself a cool tattoo. <laughs> I've chosen a tattoo. You can do it right away. Just look at that. So cool, hey? The tattoo artist previewed the image that Kalim requested to tattoo. It was the image of the Hell King. The tattooist had warned Kalim in advance not to get that tattoo, but Kalim decided to ignore it. The tattoo artist carefully tattooed the best possible tattoo on Kalim's hand to please the customer. However, he still warned Kalim that tattooing the Hell King was taboo. He also warned him to be careful because bad luck might happen. And if he wanted to remove the tattoo, he must wait at least a week. Kalim was very satisfied with his tattoo. He felt like he was stronger and more bohemian. He just kept looking at himself in the mirror and admiring himself. Kalim didn't think the Hell King's tattoo was bad luck at all. He believed that the Hell King represented the most powerful evil things. Maybe now everyone would think he looked very cool. And of course, bad luck did happen to Kalim the very next day. Although the accident did not kill him, it definitely frightened him. Because it would take a week to remove the statue, Kalim had to ask a shaman to remove the curse from the statue. The shaman invited him to a deserted alley in town. He burned the votive paper and prayed for something. Kalim also knelt beside him, showing remorse. As soon as a week passed, he would definitely remove the tattoo and sincerely beg the Hell King to forgive his sins. The shaman then created a straw effigy with Kalim's hair. He then mumbled something that Kalim could not understand. A lot of scribbled words were also written above the dummy, which seemed to be charmed. Then the straw dummy was also thrown into the burning fire. It seemed that this was a substitute ritual to help Kalim escape his current unlucky situation. The bad luck of the day caused him to be injured. 
If the bad luck had lasted a week, Kalim wouldn't know what bad would happen to him. Next, the shaman told Kalim that the ritual still had an important part. The bad luck that Kalim had was partly due to the bad things that he was doing. The tattoo on Kalim's body was just punishment for him. Kalim wanted to get out of it. He had to give up the evil path he was on and find some good things to do instead. He also added that actually printing a picture of the Hell King was not a crime. The Hell King was fair. He would only punish those who were guilty or those who did not know how to repent. After hearing what the shaman said, Kalim seemed to have a vague understanding of something. The shaman continued to instruct Kalim that soon there would be an important ritual. Whether or not it would work would depend on Kalim's bravery. The shaman said to follow him through this alley. Even if Kalim heard someone's call, there would be no answer. Kalim had to ignore it and go straight forward. When the fire went out, it was time for the shaman to walk. Kalim also followed behind, and at this time Kalim felt very tired. His mind was hazy, and he wandered off unconsciously. The air was getting cold and the shaman was walking slowly with Kalim following behind. Neither of them said anything, making less noise. The wind started howling, scarier and scarier. At this moment, Kalim heard something. The cry sounded familiar, and he woke up. The shaman said to Kalim to calm down and go on, don't care about anything. The voices, however, brought Kalim to a halt. He felt his mind go blank. He also suddenly understood something. Memories of the past had rushed back and Kalim realized his bad luck today was the payment for the sins he had committed. He slowly turned his head looking toward the source of those familiar sounds. He was sure enough behind them with shadows beckoning him. Kalim knew who they were and why they were there. They were the ghosts of people Kalim had killed, his ex-girlfriend, his debtors, all of whom were forced to death by Kalim. He seemed to realize the sins he had committed. They were always an obsession in his head. He walked away apologetically. He understood that his bad luck did not come from the Hell King, but from the sins that he had caused to those unjust souls. Kalim was completely apologetic. He felt remorse for his actions in the past, and he also wondered why he was in this mess. The shaman understood Kalim's mind. He walked away without turning back, advising Kalim to return to the path of honest business. As long as he knew how to repent, Kalim would no longer have had bad luck. He told Kalim to remove the tattoo because the King of Hell never gave anyone a second chance. The ways he helped Kalim only lasted a week. It all depended on the determination and repentance. The shaman also advised Kalim to get an honest job and do many good deeds, as many as possible. After listening to the shaman, Kalim expressed his gratitude for the help. However, his mood was still very heavy at the time. He asked the shaman with a tired face if the evil spirits would forgive him. The shaman could not answer this question either. A week later, Kalim went to remove the tattoo. He found a job at a supermarket, and the bad luck did not bother him anymore.